We are continuing to look at the book of Revelation, and I hope that this is informing our worship. When we're singing songs like we were earlier, it flows out of the revelation that we have in the scriptures of Jesus, the lion, Jesus, the lamb, Jesus eternally worshipped, Jesus at work in the world. And that's where we're going today. Um, But just before we do, I want to talk about the question, why? When things happen, people ask why, don't they? And there's, there's two different answers. I think why kind of hides two different questions. Uh, so somebody's broken their foot, and you could say why. Well, why? Because they dropped a piano on it. It's broken. That, that's, a, that's the cause, if you like, the rational cause of the broken foot. But what people are really after when they say why is not just the rational cause, is it? We, we want everything to happen for a reason. We want that answer of, oh, do you know what? They're just a really clumsy person, and they got what's coming to them. Or, oh, they're so selfless, they're always helping people. Something was bound to happen to them sooner or later. We want that kind of moral purpose narrative as well as the the rational cause. And as we look through the book of Revelation and we see some really quite dramatic, at times very difficult, things taking place in the book of Revelation, there's these two questions at play underneath the, the heading, why? And one of the questions is, look, why is this actually happening? Why are people going to continue to fight against each other um, because of the action of sin in the world? And the other is the kind of, but what's the purpose of it all? And Revelation gives us a really clear narrative of that. Like, what's the purpose behind it? What's the, what's the moral narrative that's going on? And so as we read this, I just ha- want you to have those two sort of versions of why in your head, if you like. Just a quick reminder of where we are. There's one way of splitting up the book of Revelation is is five lenses, if you like, of looking at life. Uh, We've looked at Jesus, the risen Jesus, amongst his churches in the first three chapters of the book. Um, Chapters four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven-ish are the second set. The lamb is enthroned in heavenly praise. And as we look at today's passage... Um, You may think, what's this have to do with the Lamb being enthroned in heavenly praise? We're looking at a number of uh, events happening which which translate to judgment on the earth. How is this to do with the Lamb being enthroned? But as we look through the passages, you'll see that it's interspersed with songs of praise to Jesus for, for him doing these things. And so I just want to give this context of, of what we're reading today. Jesus is not simply enthroned in heavenly praise, sitting there not doing anything, but he is in the process of bringing the earth to its just, right, good conclusion. And that's the process that we read about here. At the end of uh, chapter 5, we read about a scroll containing the destiny of our history, the destiny of the world, the destiny of of every part of creation as we know it. And it was there, sealed up, and nobody was worthy to open it. And John was distraught, you'll remember, like, no one's worthy to open the scroll. How are we ever going to find out? How are things ever going to come to their just conclusion? And the angel said to him, don't despair, don't weep. There is one who's worthy. The Lion of Judah has triumphed, and he sees the Lamb who looked like it was slain, the lion and the lamb together. The lamb goes and takes the the scroll. And what we read today is him starting to open it. I'm just going to read the first bit of this passage. We're actually going to draw on three or four chapters today, and I'm not going to read them all out verbatim. But I just want to give you um, an introduction. You'll probably be familiar with the phrase, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This is where, this is the passage where that comes from. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures, now they were around the throne, four living creatures, you'll remember, they represent all of creation between them. I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! 
Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A kilogram of wheat for a day's wages, and three kilograms of barley for a day's wages. And do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a quarter of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign lords? How long? until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? How do you feel as we read that passage? Is there a bit of discomfort? Yeah? And I think there should be. I think that's right. There should be discomfort. We're reading about not just some theoretical thing that might happen, but we're reading about what is right now going on around the world. Wars, famines, plagues. This is, this is real life, and on the one hand, it is disconcerting to read the Bible and find in it death and war, and sometimes seemingly by the hand of God, and that can be disconcerting. And if it doesn't bother us, there's a possibility we've not really done business with that. But on the other hand, is it not also reassuring that the things that we see around us happening in the world, that they're spoken of here, this is not some deviation from the plan that God didn't foresee, but the Bible speaks about the very era that we are in now and informs us about it. So the question I want to really ask today is that why is God telling us this? Why in the scriptures, alongside Jesus' teaching on how we live morally, alongside a description of his death and his resurrection, alongside uh, time after time a declaration of his love and his faithfulness, why is he telling us about death and war and judgment and famine and plague coming on the earth. We're going to try and answer that as we go through the passage with little snapshots from these passages. But also, I just want to start off with one example. Um, A lot of you will know my best friend James because we prayed for him when he was um, going through liver failure. He has a condition called PSC, which means that sooner or later his bile duct clogs up and then his liver packs in and... Two years ago, almost to the day now, uh, he had a liver transplant. Uh, I looked at the, the information pack they gave him, and it was a wadge this thick. This is what to expect when you undergo a liver transplant. Now, at this stage, James was largely unable to get off his bed for more than half an hour to go. Uh, his skin was yellow. He was in a really, really serious condition. Um, life was just... So it was, it, was a, it was a chore. He was obviously worried about everything that would come. And there was this hope in the form of a liver transplant, but it was going to be quite a process with all kinds of risks along the way, with a lot of pain along the way, with a very long recovery period and all of that. And there was this huge information booklet about all of the risks 
all of the things that could go wrong, all of the pain, all of the recovery, the drugs, all of this kind of stuff to go through. But the end, the promise at the end of it, was new life. It's been such a joy the last couple of years, particularly the last year, to see James just living in that new life that he's got. He just takes every opportunity. He's like an even more present dad than he ever was before, even though he was a fantastic dad already. He plays sport, he cycles everywhere. He's like, I've been given this new life. and I'm going to jolly well live it. And um, he needed to go through that painful process to get there. And he needed to be told in advance what to expect. That's actually true for pretty much any serious medical procedure. And, you know, many of you will have undergone or perhaps be looking forward to something like that. Part of this, part of the reason Jesus is telling us this is because there is pain to go through for the earth in order to come to new life. And I think we'd all agree that the world that we live in at the moment, as it is, is not the ideal. And what Revelation tells us is it might need to get worse before it gets better. So be warned. Now, that may not sound like an encouraging message in the same way that reading that huge tract of information about a liver transplant or whatever else it might be that you might be thinking of undergoing doesn't sound like an encouraging message, except if you look to the end. And I want to say, if you find yourself, as you're reading through Revelation, feeling disquieted, feeling uncomfortable, or feeling depressed, that could be true as well, you are allowed to flick to the end. Okay, I, I go to Revelation 20 and 21 anytime I feel down, because there's a promise there that I'm living for, and whether life goes up or goes down between now and then, we're getting to Revelation 20 and 21. And I just want to encourage you, you're allowed to look ahead. Like, let it hurt you, because these things are, they are hurtful. This is, this is the reality of the pain around us, and we're a bit cushioned from it in Wheatley, in terms of global terms. But it's the reality of the world around us, so we do need to allow that to affect us. But do look to the end and see where Jesus is leading us. That's one of the reasons that we have this in here. Persevere because there is good coming after evil has had its way. Okay, we're going to turn to a little bit about the structure of the passage because it's quite helpful. As you read through Revelation, you come across seven this, seven that, seven this, and sometimes three as well. So we have seven seals, we have seven trumpets, we have three woes, and then later on we have seven bowls. And it's probably just helpful to see how those fit together, just so we don't get lost. Um, so this is how they fit together. We have these seven seals that the, the lamb opens on the scroll. Um, and those seven seals sit together as a unit. But on the seventh seal, I pressed the wrong way, didn't I? There we go. <laughs> on the seventh seal, there are seven trumpets that come out of that. So the seventh seal unlocks these seven trumpets. Um, and then those last three seven trumpets are so significant, they come with three declarations of woe, if you like. Okay, so that's how it sits together. Seven seals, seven trumpets on the last seal, three woes on the last of the trumpets. There's this sense of like acceleration. We'll leave the bowls for later, by the way. They come up later in the, in the book. There's this sense of kind of compression, acceleration. As things go on, we should be expecting the intensity to increase. That's part of what we're seeing from this structure. And I think that's probably part of what we are living in, isn't it? At the time that Revelation would have been written, they had really quite wide-ranging conflicts and wars. But in the 20th century, we've seen the whole world at war. There's this acceleration, there's this expansion, there's this increase of these things. And so it's just helpful to see that that's in there. Um, it does help us to persevere as we see wickedness increasing. That's not a sign that God's out of control. That's a sign of this is what he's talked about already. Seven's quite significant. We've talked about this before. Seven is, is a number of completeness. Um, when you see seven in the Bible, it's either perfection or completeness. And actually that word is very similar, the word for perfection and for completion. Um, but it's also made up of four and three. And those numbers are significant um, in the Bible as well. Now, we just need to remember, this is the language of Revelation. This is not people going back afterwards and, and trying to find things that aren't there. But this is in the language of Revelation. This is what a Greek reader 
or a Jewish reader would have got out of reading this text. So the four, seven, four plus three, the four generally represents all of creation. And you see that throughout the prophetic writings. The earth has four corners, even though it doesn't, you know, that's a way of talking about the four corners of the earth is all the earth. Uh, there are four winds generally in the scriptures, and we have four living creatures around the throne, like an ox, an eagle, a man, and what did I miss, lion, They're kind of representing all the different facets of creation. So four generally speaks of all the earth, all of earth's creation. And then three is the number of God. Um, three is the trinity. Uh, when God is declared to be holy, he's holy, holy, holy. The way that you say most holy in Hebrew is to repeat it three times. So three is the number of the Lord. Three is the number of the heavens, if you like. And so when we read about sevens, it's it's everything, it's perfection, it's completion, and it's also the earth and the heavens. And we see that here. So if we go through the different seals, I decided black was just getting a bit too depressing. We've gone with white background here. Um, it was a little bit intense, wasn't it? So um, we've got four and then three of these seals. And the first one, if we read through it, I'll put a question mark after this because there are other interpretations. This is the interpretation that I find most convincing. The first seal releases this horse, which is given a crown, and it rides out bent on conquest. Now, later on, Jesus is seen as a rider on a white horse, but he is in every way better than this one. This one is given a crown. Jesus has earned his crown. Uh, this one just has one. I believe that Jesus later on has seven crowns on his head. This feels like it's an imitation, and he rides out bent on conquest. Most people would identify that with this sense of the Antichrist, the, the against God horse coming into the world. There is opposition to the message. There is opposition to Jesus's uh, kingdom expanding. And the first seal releases that on the earth. The second seal is war. The third one is famine. And the fourth one is death. These are all earthly consequences. Do you see? So this is the first four is the, the earth. And then the second three, or the last three rather, the fifth seal brings with it a cry for justice, doesn't it, in the heavenlies. You see these souls under the altar saying, how long, how long, Lord, until you avenge us? How long until you do what is good and right? Do you hear in that Abraham's prayer of like, will not the Lord of all the earth do what is right? This is not an actual impatience with Jesus. It's just a cry of like, Jesus, do, do what you said you will do. Do what you've said you will do. And then the sixth seal, there's this kind of earth and heaven quake, if you like. The earth's shaken, the heavens shake, it rolls up like a scroll. The heavens are always this solid presence throughout the scriptures, uh, like the heavens... Isaiah says, would you rend the heavens and come down? But the heavens are there and constant, whatever happens on the earth. And now we see this is really cataclysmic because the heavens themselves are shaken and rolled up like a scroll. And then with the seventh seal comes active judgment, the seven trumpets, which represent God actively standing against uh, sin in the world. Um, to get the idea between the seals and the trumpets, I want you to imagine for a second... Um, I've got a rock in my hand. Okay, if I throw the rock in the air, what's going to happen to me? If I throw it right up in the air, it's going to come down and hit me on the head. Okay, so the seals represent what we might call the wrath of God. God is baked into creation that if I throw a rock in the air, it is going to land on me. It's going to hurt me. Okay, that's, that's what we sometimes call the wrath of God. And in the same way, it is baked into creation that if you go and harm somebody, there will be this cycle of retribution that will spill out from that. We see it right at the very beginning of creation with Cain and Abel. And from that one first sin um, of Adam and Eve, we see then Cain murdering his brother. And then before you know it, the whole earth is full of wickedness and violence. It's only a few generations before God says, the whole world is so full of violence, I'm grieved I even made it. And that is baked into creation. And these first four um, horsemen that ride out, 
represent, this is what happens just when human nature is left to itself. When we are unjust to each other, when we are violent towards each other, unloving towards each other, it, it all happens. <laughs> and it keeps getting worse. This is what we might call the wrath of God. When we get to the trumpets, that's then God actively judging. Now that's like if I've got that rock and I throw it at somebody, and I hit Tim with the rock, okay, I'm going to get hauled in front of court and I'm going to be judged for my actions. It's not baked into creation so much as it's an active act of judgment. And that's what we have. The seals are kind of, the, if you like, the natural consequences and the trumpets are the active act of judgment. So, I said that the overarching question is, why is God telling us this? I want to take little snapshots from these passages and just use them to answer that. And here are, here are our answers that I think are worth pulling out of this. You may find your own as well. And the first one comes out of the fact that these four riders go out more or less indiscriminately, it seems. If we just read this again, at the end of the four horsemen, they were given power over a quarter of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. And in the face of this earthly famine, plague, war, these souls under the altar call out, Lord, how much longer till you do what's right? And God says, just a little longer. Just a little longer. In the meantime, there continues to be violence. There continues to be injustice. The thing about the, the wheat and the barley is an interesting one. If we just take an aside here. So when the, the horse that's often labelled famine rides out, I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying a kilogram of wheat for a day's wages, three kilograms of barley for a day's wages, and don't damage the oil and the wine. Now, those prices, a kilogram of wheat for three days, or barley was generally the, the grain of the poor in those days for a day's wages, that's, that's pretty tough. That's famine, but that's not starvation. So it's, it's really, really tough on the poor, but not totally broken. But don't touch the oil and the wine. Well, the oil and the wine were, were the things for the rich. Particularly wine was, you know, that was a luxury. And so when we read this, we see a prediction here of that kind of systemic injustice where it's hardest on the poor and the poor get poorer. And it's, you know, the, the, the rich seem to be less scathed by this. And all of this causes these souls under the altar to say, Lord, how long till you put all of this right? And God says, just a little bit longer. In addition to that, they were given power over a quarter of the earth. Later on, as we get to the trumpets, we see judgment on a third of the earth here, a third of the earth there. What's the significance of that number? We've talked about threes and sevens, we've talked about fours. What about when it's a fraction? Well, if we split something half and half, that's an even split, isn't it? Um, but a third, it's like, it's significant, it's not tiny. But it's not, it's not even. It's not even-handed. It's not a 50-50 side of things. And what comes out of this is that although these bad things will happen in the earth, God is still restraining. This is not go out and kill the whole earth. This is not even go out and take out half the earth. There's a restraint to it. God is reigning in, even now, God is reigning in evil. He's allowing it to ride. He's allowing it to have its day, but he's reigning it in. And out of this, I think God wants us to understand more of his character. Now, we don't, I think, in our culture, very much like the idea of a God who judges. I think in the church, we've perhaps got a slightly better handle on that, but it's still probably one of the most uncomfortable bits of God's character in terms of how we speak to people outside the church about it. But God wants us to understand his character. He is a God of justice, and he is also a good God. And we need to get our heads around that. He is a God of justice, and he is a good God, and he is also patient. And if he allows evil to continue for a time, it is because he is patient. Not because he doesn't care, not because he's corrupt or unjust, but because he's patient. God wants us to know everything about him. He wants us to know his wrath and his judgment and his patience and his justice and his mercy, and to hold all of that together 
and still say, come Lord Jesus. And that's a challenge to us, isn't it? But this is one of the challenges of Revelation as we read on. And I want to encourage you to turn this one over because it's one of the biggest challenges you will get as you read this book is can we still wholeheartedly say, come Lord Jesus, even though we know that when he comes, he comes with wrath and judgment as well as with love and mercy and patience and faithfulness. The book ends with the spirit and the bride, the church and the Lord saying, come. And I want to encourage you to work these questions through so that by the time we get to chapter 21, in a few weeks' time, you've done some more processing of that and you are wholeheartedly saying, yes, come. We need the operation, even though it's painful. Come, Lord Jesus, because you are good and we trust you. The living creatures all say, come. Later on, the spirit and the bride say, come. And when they say, come, you notice it's linked to these horses riding out. The first living creature says, come, and outrides the first, first horse. The second living creature says, come, and outrides the second horse. When we say, come, Lord Jesus, we are inviting all the things that are necessary before the end. Now, we're not wishing any harm on anybody, specifically when we say that. But we are saying, Lord, come, even though we know that that involves all the things that we read in this book. And if he's slow in answering that prayer, if we feel like we've been saying, come Lord Jesus, and you're not here yet, that's because he's patient. And Peter talks about that as well. He says, some people scoff and say, where is this Jesus, this second coming you're talking about? And they don't realize that God is not slow, he's patient. So that's the first thing God wants us to know, is that he is just and good. Those two are not separate, they're together. The second thing I want to pull out of this comes from the sixth seal. Now, when we open the sixth seal, where are we? Um, the end of, uh, yeah, so the end of chapter six. He opens the sixth seal, there's this huge earthquake, and then we pause on the seals for a minute. Um, people are terrified at this stage, utterly terrified. Who knows the song Cinnamon by Nina Simone? You know that one? That's taken from here. You know, the, the people crying out, rocks, hide me, and the river's boiling, and this, you know, this, this is drawn from this imagery here. Um, people are terrified, and they ask this question, the great, the great day of their wrath has come, who can withstand it? And there's an answer to that question, because the very next thing that happens is that four angels are sent out to seal those who belong to Jesus. So the question here is, who can withstand the wrath of the Lamb? And the answer is, those who belong to Jesus. Those who belong to Jesus can stand. And then we'd expect to be straight on with the seventh seal, right? But we're not. Because what af happens after that is we see this wonderful scene of heavenly worship. This is 7 verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. We have this scene of heavenly worship going on at this point. In the middle of all that God is doing, we pause for the worship of God's people before things move on. Then when we open the seventh seal, there's silence in heaven for half an hour. Before anything else happens, there's silence, and then another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. And the smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. 
This is the second thing that God wants us to know from Revelation, is that we have agency, we have a part to play. I remember it's one of the very first questions I wrestled with when I came to faith at the age of 14, was like, if God is sovereign and he already has a plan, and people say he has a plan for my life, I was still new to all of that, and he has a plan for the world, then why does it matter what I pray? Is he just not going to do what he's going to do? What significance do I have in this? And, and God doesn't need us to pray, and he doesn't need us to do anything. He's perfectly able to just do this all himself, and yet he does want us to. He gives us a place in this working out of his purposes. And the seventh seal is not complete until God's people have worshipped and until their prayers have been offered up before God. Those who can stand are those who belong to Jesus and they have a place. That place is in offering worship and in praying. In a bit, we're going to be praying from the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. We have a place to play in this, in praying that God's kingdom would come. Our suffering and our sacrifice makes a difference, even though Jesus has already suffered and been sacrificed for us. Paul talks in Colossians about filling up in his body that which is lacking with regard to the suffering of Christ. He doesn't mean that Jesus didn't suffer enough, but he sees that before all things can be brought to completion, there is some suffering that is going to need to take place. There is further suffering and sacrifice that will take place before the end. And he's like, if I fill my body up with it, then I'm saving it from someone else. That's his way of seeing it. So I want you to know that when you suffer, however great or however small, when you suffer because you belong to Jesus, when you make sacrifices in your life in order to serve Jesus, you are filling up in your body part of what is needed before the end comes. It has value. Jesus values it. Even though he doesn't need it, he values it. Our worship makes a difference. When we sing on a Sunday morning, it does us good. It shapes our souls. It honors him. But it's not just that. We are singing in the kingdom of God because worship is a part of the kingdom of God coming. God is quite capable of demonstrating his power and his character all on his own, and yet he wants our worship to be part of his kingdom coming. And even though the scroll has the battle plan of God for how he's going to finally bring all things to a good conclusion, our prayers make a difference. Now, that's, it's just a truth. They make a difference. Now, you can struggle to get your head around it. I struggle to get my head around it sometimes, but it's true. And when we gather and pray, when you shut yourself in your room and you pray on your own, it is all part of God bringing all things to conclusion. It is not without value. When we gather here on a Wednesday night once a month, and it's only one expression of prayer, but it's our key corporate expression of prayer, we are praying in the kingdom of God, and it makes a difference. We're not simply reminding ourselves to be faithful until he does what he was always going to do. We have more agency than that. Jesus wants us to know his character. He wants us to know we have agency. And who are these people who are worshipping? In 7 verse 9, who are the people? The ones who've been through the Great Tribulation. Brilliant. We'll come back to that in a second. What else? Someone else said something else. They're God's people. Yeah, absolutely. Where are they from? Every tribe, every language, every nation. Okay, when we pray for Albania, or when we were praying for our friends in the country we weren't even going to name because of security concerns, you know, the gospel is intended for every nation. The Great Tribulation, these people are from the Great Tribulation. What does that mean, do we think? Is it referring to some specific event? Is there, is there a future or a past event that is the Great Tribulation? I don't think that's the picture of Revelation. The picture of Revelation seems to point to an ongoing tribulation until such a time as Jesus comes again. And I think the clearest reading of this is this is us. This is everybody from the time that Jesus was incarnated 
And he suffered from the very outset, didn't he? Because right at the very outset, Herod was out to kill him. The devil was out to thwart the plan, and he had to escape to Egypt and live as a refugee. So from the very outset, there was a tribulation, and that has continued escalating, increasing, as God's people grow, and the gospel is going all over the world, and people are turning to faith, and as a result, the opposition is growing, and we are these people in the great tribulation. A great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language. I think this is the third thing that Jesus wants us to know, is the gospel is for all nations, and it has to go out. I have in my heart, there are countries in the world where there is still no gospel presence. They are so closed that there is nobody there actively witnessing. Now, there's not many. They are narrowing. They are diminishing. But we need to go. I'm so, so excited that we are a church that is committed to helping support overseas mission. And that's not just unreached peoples. That's also just the peoples of the world. But let's make sure we have nations in our heart. Because God is a God of all nations. He's not just Jewish. He's not just British. Is he British at all? Um, But he is the God of nations. And it will take all nations gathered around his throne to properly honour him. I want to encourage you. Have you you seen the book Operation World? It's a fantastic guide to praying for the nations of the world. Pray for that. Or pick up the Open Doors prayer diary and pray through like the the most persecuted nations and, and hold them up before God. Support where you can, in prayer, in finance. I wonder if God's calling some of us to go, even. I don't say that lightly. I wonder if he is. The gospel is always intended to go. And what we see in these 144,000 people um, who are sealed as belonging to God, 12 tribes of Israel, that's everybody from the Old Covenant. We've seen this already in a different setting. 12 apostles of those who are originally called That's the the people who are called under the new covenant to Jesus. Times 10, times 10, times 10, like a multitude. What we're saying is this is all of God's people. All of God's people from all time, gathered and sealed. Just an interesting thing here. um, For those who are concerned, this might be a literal reading. And some people have said, does this not just mean that only Israel will be saved? Um, Who is the firstborn of Israel? Jacob. What was the first tribe? Reuben. Okay, Reuben was the firstborn. And yet, in this list, you're running ahead of me, in this list, Judah is put first. Because what this is pointing to is something that actually Joseph, no, sorry, Jacob foresaw and prophesied about. Judah was going to come to a place of of preeminence. Why? Who is the descendant of Judah? Jesus. Okay. Jesus is at the head of this. And if you read down, you'll notice there's one missing. Does anyone spot which tribe is missing? Dan. Yes, whoever said that. Well done. The tribe of Dan is missing. Now, that could just be sort of he needed to miss one out in order to put something else in. But it seems Dan is regularly the tribe of violence. They're the tribe who go and wipe out a city and invade it and make it their own and call it Dan after themselves. And there's there's something in here of like, Everybody comes in under Jesus. That's why Judah is first. Everybody comes under Jesus. This is not just about the people of Israel being saved. This is all of God's people being gathered in under Jesus. The Messianic um, Joseph tribe comes in instead of Dan. And Judah heads the way. And these people are all justified. They're wearing white robes. They're all praising. This is the picture that we have. We all have a place to play. We will all be those people who dressed in white because Jesus has justified us and made us clean. Worship and pray the kingdom of God until it comes. So in a minute, what we're going to do is pray this together. And I'd just like us to pause on those bold lines there. And I'd like us to pray them three times over. Now, all the lines are important of the Lord's Prayer. This is not singling those out as more important, but I just want to single them out as, let's emphasize those today. When we say, your kingdom come, we're not just saying, Jesus, would you 
come and make things better now, although he does. He is gracious and he works in situations and he brings healing and he brings freedom and he brings deliverance and he sees people brought into his kingdom. But he also comes in wrath and judgment on the world. And we're also saying, you need to come and do that as well, Jesus. We trust you that you are fair and we don't always get our heads around it. You come, whatever that means, because we want it to be on earth as it is in heaven. So let's pray that through now together. Should we stand and pray this? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's repeat that. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts. We've forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is the prayer Jesus gave us. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us stay standing. I'm going to hand back to Luke and Hannah to lead us in worship.